Good morning. Welcome to the presence of the Lord. Well, these few weeks, the Lord has been uh, leading us in this worship, revolving around the study of the book of Micah. Remember the book of Micah? The name Micah really means who is like the Lord. And we have certainly come to appreciate the justice of our Lord in His judgment, the mercy in His salvation. And in a sense, coming together right now as Gentiles to worship God is really a partial fulfillment of Micah chapter 4, verse 1 to 5, part of which is also quoted verbatim in Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2 to 4. So for, therefore, for a call to worship, may I just invite all of us right now to just make a stand as we read aloud the Micah 4, 1 to 5 together. And I invite those of you who are joining us virtually to also make a stand wherever you are, even on live or on delayed broadcast to join us in this reading together. Shall we all just read this aloud? In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills and people will stream to it. Many nations will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us His ways so that we may walk in His path. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between many peoples and will settle disputes for strong nations far and wide. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Everyone will sit under their own vine and under their own fig tree, and no one will make them afraid, for the Lord Almighty has spoken. All the nations may walk in the name of their gods, but we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. Let's join our hearts together in prayer, shall we? Oh, this morning, we thank you, Lord, that we can make this ascent up your mountain, the mountain of the Lord's temple, the highest of the mountains, and it alone is exalted above all hills. And Lord, you by your grace and mercy have drawn us from all nations, just streaming to your presence this very day like an unseen magnetic force. And as we come, we gratefully proclaim to one another, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. Teach us your way, O God, and we promise to walk in your paths. Let your law go forth from Zion. Let your word go forth from Jerusalem. Drench us with your words on the outside, even on the inside. Transform us and make us a living word of praise unto you moment by moment. So come, Lord Jesus, come. We look forward to that day when you come again and when you judge all people and when you personally will even settle the disputes of the nations and when you make nations beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Oh, who is like the Lord? The unbelievers may walk in the name of their gods, but we, we who are here, we will walk in the name of our God forever and ever. May your name alone be higher, be stronger than all. Lord Jesus, may you be exalted over all. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's join our hearts together right now, remaining standing, as we allow the songs of worship to draw us into God's presence. Good morning, church. Let's get ready to worship God wherever you are. 
in your rooms, um, in your halls, or even in the sanctuary today.
I am safe on this solid ground. The Lord is my
Who is like the Lord our God, strong to save, faithful to love? My debt is paid and the victory is won. Let's proclaim the Lord is our salvation. Indeed, the Lord's Supper is a proclamation to all the world and especially to believers whenever we partake of it. A reminder to us, a reenactment to us, and more important, a reinforcement in our faith of the Lord is our salvation. It is a sacrament commanded by our Lord Jesus for all of us to remember his death and what he has done for us. Interestingly, I always wonder, why would the Lord use a meal to help us mark this most important event and memory? Couldn't he do something more spiritual, like perhaps through prayer or through worship in songs? Or something that we say or something that we do or something that we even write or even draw? Or perhaps some places that we should go to or some buildings that we should come under? But he chose a very ordinary thing that we always do day in and day out, a meal of eating food, of drinking water. And actually, if you think about the idea of the meal, we discover that God was really interested in our meals right from the beginning. Right from Genesis to Revelation, he has many things that he does together with us two meals. Genesis 2, 9 talk about God giving us food through the trees, you know, when he created. The tree of life, the tree of knowledge of uh, evil and good, these are food too. And then when we look into the Bible, we realize that when Abraham communed with the angels who visited him, they communed around food. And the very angels, when they went to meet the Lord, they also communed around food. And when the Old Testament comes and, and uh, brings the people out of Egypt, God provided food for his people. And when they enter into the promised land, the, almost the entire book of Leviticus is about food laws and food ceremony and all about food with the Lord. It's as though the Lord is telling us there's something wonderful about communing and communing with me to food. When Jesus comes in the New Testament, we know he too made miracles of feeding thousands with food. His ministry was all about eating and feasting and food with people right until the very day when he commemorated the Last Supper. His teaching was about food. In the New Testament, in Acts, the disciples gathered around food to remember Jesus. And right to the end of Revelation, it talk about the marriage supper of the Lamb, another banquet of food. And do you know something? Revelation 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hear my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will eat with him. And I think all of these help me see the significance of why God would have us eat with him. When we eat something, we are ingesting something into us. We are, it is a very personal and a very intimate thing that we are doing. And when we begin to realize that this whole significance of uh, the communion is about eating with Christ. When, when two persons are eating together, there is really that trust. There is really that fellowship with one another. And I think God is really wanting us to understand that this meal marks this special fellowship that we all have with him. And when we ingest food into our body, we allow the food to do a change in our body, whether it is to provide us nutrients, whether it is medicine to provide us some medical transformation to help us. And when we come to the Lord in this manner, it is really, really to allow God to speak into our inner lives, the very lives of ourselves. And so today, as we come before the Lord's table, I urge all of us to come with reverence, to come into his table with worship and with gratefulness for what Christ has done for us, for what Christ is doing for us, 
for what Christ will be doing for us. And so if you know the Lord Jesus personally, we want you to really come before him with that worship. But perhaps there are some of us watching this or in our midst who have not yet known the Lord personally, then I'd like you to just not take this part of communion until the day you come to know the Lord. And if you yet to know him, check with your Christian friends around you. And for those of you who are having this meal together right now with your children, take this as a teaching opportunity to just teach them what it means to have this personal relationship with God. May I just invite all of us who would have received the communion element to just prepare ourselves for the communion. And if you have forgotten or missed the communion element, if you need one, you just put up your hands and uh, we'll, we'll make sure that you have one. So just put your hand high if you have need one for those of you who are here. In instructing the people on celebrating the Holy Communion in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 27 to verse 28, the Apostle Paul warned us this way. He says, So then, whoever eats the bread and drinks of the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. And so I think it's very important for us to just take this moment quietly first before we even consume the element to solemnly prepare ourselves to go into a time of self-examination, a time of confession of sins as the Spirit that may impress upon us, and at the same time a recommitment or perhaps even a restoration of relationship to the Lord. Can we just take a very short moment to come before the Lord in silence? You know, earlier in the First Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 to 26, the Apostle Paul has said this, I receive from the Lord what I also have given to you. The Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he has given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup, it's a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you drink this, take this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Shall we take this time to just consume the element, the bread? consume the wine together. So in every celebration of the communion of the, by the body of Christ, we call to remembrance what Christ has done for us in giving his body on the cross and in shedding his blood for our sins. But I think what is more important is that we choose today, henceforth, to live not unto ourselves, but unto him who died for us all. And at the same time, we look forward towards the day when Christ will drink this anew with us in the Father's kingdom, as he told us. Shall we pray? God, beyond all praising, we worship you today. We sing the love amazing, the songs cannot repay. And as we come before your presence, with your table before us, we are mindful of what the psalmists have said. You even prepare a table 
before us in the presence of our enemies. And we understand, therefore, Lord, that in the midst of struggles, in the midst of challenges and hostilities, we can still remember, we can still rejoice, we can still be rejuvenated because of this personal salvation that you have given to all of us. And thank you, therefore, Lord, for visiting us in this way. Lord, today as we meet in this manner, we are mindful of the fact how, how privileged we are in the comfortable place, in the freedom of this country to worship you here early in the morning on the Lord's Day. We are mindful of those who are shut in, those who are sick, those who are not with us today. Lord, we ask that, Lord, in whatever the state of life of hell they may be, visit them too, Lord. Intervene in their lives and help them, Lord, to experience your salvation in very personal ways. We remember the world, Lord, and how many in the world today are struggling in the COVID situation. And Lord, therefore, we want to pray for your healing and for your help, O oh Lord, as we look up to you. Lord, we pray that in countries where the spread is so widespread and where people are living in fear, O oh God, we pray for your protection. We pray, Lord, mercifully, you will put a stop to the spread of this virus. We pray, O oh God, that the help in the form of a vaccine can be achieved speedily. We also pray, Lord, for many businesses, many of our people that we even personally know of who are financially affected because of the restrictions of this period. O oh Lord, we want to pray that you will help in a very tangible, practical way and provide for all those who trust and call upon you. And God, this morning, even as we come before your presence with your word open before us, we ask for your anointing upon our speaker, Elder Lawrence, the Lord, as he teach us from Michael 4, Lord, that you will speak through him into our hearts. Right now, Lord, we lay ourselves open before you we ask God, you speak for your servant here. In Jesus' name, amen. Elder Lawrence. Who is like the Lord in restoring his kingdom? Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. So glad to see all of you uh, here today. You know, I, I find it hard to actually see you, your faces. First, because of the shield. Secondly, because of your mask. You know, standing here and watching all of you with your mask makes me feel that we are, we are in some kind of medical convention of some kind. You know, and you know, Look, but things are, are looking well in Singapore. Uh, we are glad that uh, things are a lot brighter and we certainly look forward uh, to phase three before the end of the year. For those of us who are watching online, uh, welcome. But I would really encourage you, you, know, you get yourself off the sofa, you know, some of you off the bed even. You know. Register for the service and then come and worship God together with us in, in person. You know, you can take, definitely can take a few more bodies uh, in this, uh, in this uh, huge space that is here. On 14th of May, 2018, coinciding with the 70th anniversary of the founding of modern Israel in 1948, the U.S. Embassy shifted its offices. I'm sorry, this is not working. Uh -huh. Maybe somebody can do it for me up there. I can't get this to work. The, the U.S. Embassy in Israel shifted its offices from, from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Uh, several years later, uh, President Trump, addressing uh, his group of supporters at a political rally, uh, recounted this event. And then he said this. He said that, you know, we moved the capital of Israel to Jerusalem. And that's one for the evangelicals. We all know that Trump's uh, 
statement and his move is really uh, political, uh, fulfilling his election promises that he had made to supporters. And I also personally think that he probably uh, did not fully appreciate the, the theological significance of the statement that he made. But in truth, conservative Christian support for Israel is rooted not in politics, but in theology. For Christians, Israel as a nation, Jerusalem as its capital, will feature strongly in many end-time prophecies in the Bible, you know, some of which we will see in Micah chapter 4 today. In the first three chapters of uh, Micah, as we have seen over the past few weeks, we've seen how greed and injustice had prevailed both in Israel in the north and Judah in the south. You know, things have gotten so bad that, that different branches of leadership in the land, they were colluding to defraud the people that they were supposed to lead. You know, the leaders were not only abetting the wealthy to exploit the poor, they were also guilty of doing it themselves. Instead of calling out sin, instead of calling out the injustice, the prophets were accepting bribes to preach false messages of peace, of security. It was in such an environment that Micah delivered his warnings. Judgment is coming, and how severely it came. Firstly, on Israel in the north, as it fell to the Assyrians in 722 BC. And then more than 100 years uh, later, the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians in 586 BC. So this morning, we, we come to chapter 4, where we see Micah make an about turn. Now, after his warnings of judgment, 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 uh, in the first three chapters, Micah now turns and, and he assures the people, yes, God must deal with sin, but he will not always judge. He will not always discipline. That in the midst of God's judgment, there is hope. There will be grace. There will be mercy. And after he has disciplined his people, God will restore them to himself. And in the, in the last days, uh, Micah tells us that God will bring about an ultimate restoration of the world through this promised kingdom of Jesus Christ that we read earlier from verse 1 to 5. See, Pastor Ma had uh, alluded earlier in his remarks, that the, in, in the remarks in, in his call to worship, that, that what we read in, in verses 1 to 5 have in a sense been partially fulfilled uh, today. You know, in 13 verses of, of chapter 4, Micah has traversed almost 3,000 years and more, depending on why, when uh, Christ is coming back in his second coming. So as we go through chapter 4 today, you will have to discern in your heart and discern in your minds uh, where, where has it arrived and where is still not yet. And that, that is the complexity that you will see uh, in, in this chapter as we, as we go through. You know, many, many writers uh, in, in the Bible wrote of this, this future kingdom that is to be established on earth in the last days. You know, this term, uh, the last days, uh, or the latter days, depending on which uh, version uh, you, are, you are using, it refers to the period of time between the first and the second coming of Christ. So literally, it refers to this church age that we are now in. Revelation chapter 20 also, also tells us that Christ will rule in this, uh, in this kingdom for 1,000 years. Still not working very well. I can't do this. Okay. It's on. Yeah, it's on. It's just not working. Never mind. Maybe somebody can, can just uh, go forward for me. Can you go forward? This is not a set. Actually. Just go forward. Go forward. Go forward. Uh, 
I can't, I can't, go. never mind. So let me, let me, let me go through it. Huh? So many writers in, in, in the Bible wrote of this uh, future kingdom that will be established on earth in the last days. Um, Revelation chapter 20 tells us that, that, that Christ will rule in this kingdom for 1,000 years. So, so you, may, you may have heard of another term related to this kingdom called the millennium or the millennial kingdom. Now, this word, millennium, actually comes from, from two words. Mille, which means uh, 1,000, and annum, which of course means uh, years. Eh? So, the millennial kingdom of Christ is a future kingdom on earth that Jesus Christ will rule for 1,000 years. You know, I want to also state uh, at, this, at this time that uh, given the nature of end-time prophecies, as I said earlier, you know, Micah has traversed uh, 3,000 years or more in, in, in 13 verses. So there will be differences of opinion as to what chapter 4 uh, is, is saying. So what you will hear uh, from me this morning is, is one view. Uh, it's probably the most widely accepted view among the conservative evangelical churches. But if you Google, uh, chances are you will see many, many other views. And, and actually, I would uh, encourage you, you know, some of those uh, views you really shouldn't pay too much attention to. So this morning, if you, if you disagree uh, with, with uh, some of my points, uh, I will understand. Chinese. But if you really need someone to, to talk to, or to bounce off ideas, uh, you can always uh, buy me a cup of coffee, yeah? and then we can have a, a friendly discussion. I won't call it a debate. Let's have a friendly discussion, and then we can uh, cl clarify each other's uh, thinking. So if you have not already done so, can you please turn in your Bibles to Micah chapter 4? Okay, very good. It's working now. No, somebody is controlling for me, yeah? Okay, pretend. Never mind. Okay, Micah chapter 4, uh, you, you hold it there uh, as, we, as we continue. Chapter 4, verse 1, it says, that It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains. The house of the Lord here refers to the temple that is in Jerusalem. Micah tells us that in the last days, Jerusalem where this temple is located, will become the highest of the mountains. In other words, in, in the millennial kingdom of Christ, Jerusalem will become very central, and its position in the world will be, will be elevated. You know, today, the mega cities of New York, London, Tokyo, uh, Shanghai, uh, they draw millions, uh, pre-COVID, of course, uh, but mostly for you know, maybe leisure, maybe some, some business. In the millennial kingdom, the capital of the world will no longer be New York or London, no longer be Beijing or Shanghai, but little Jerusalem in the Middle East. In the millennial kingdom, Jerusalem will in fact become the most important city in the world. Verse 1 tells us that many peoples will flow or will stream to Jerusalem. In other words, in the millennium, people will go voluntarily to Jerusalem, like a, pil like a spiritual uh, pilgrimage. You know, today, Christians, uh, some of us uh, have done this. We, we go to Jerusalem so that we can walk the streets that Jesus walked. But verse 2 tells us that in the last days, many Gentile nations will go to Jerusalem so that they can worship the Lord. They will go to Jerusalem to learn of God's ways and to walk in them. And God's word will literally flow out of Jerusalem like a stream of water to influence the world, to become the standard, the banner for living. Verse 3 tells us that Christ will be the ultimate judge and arbiter of nations in this kingdom. So the system of government, the, the Tsinghu in, in the Millennium Kingdom, it will not be a democracy. It will be a monarchy. It will be a kingship. 
but it will be a divine, righteous, and benevolent kingship. You know, someone once said, I think it might be John Calvin, you know, that, that democracy is God's gift of check and balance when sinful men are in charge. When sinful men no longer rule, democracy will no longer be needed. Zechariah chapter 14, verse 9, uh, speaking of Christ's rule in the millennial kingdom, said this, and the Lord will be king over all the earth. In that day, the Lord will be the only one, and his name, the only one. Jesus Christ will be the single supreme monarch of this earthly global kingdom. See, friends, we we just need to to take a a quick look at our world today. We can see some trends and we can see some traces of a global system of governance, commerce, and trade being formed. We've seen in recent years, you know, the growth and development of uh, global shipping, global shopping. You know, some of us now like to to shop using our fingertips. uh, and, And logistic giants... Amazon, uh, Alibaba, DHL, FedEx, you know, or global technology companies and platforms like Apple, Microsoft, Google, YouTube, Netflix, uh, even Huawei, huh? as well as global virtual communities in their billions, not in their millions, in their billions, managed by the likes of Facebook, Instagram, WeChat, WhatsApp, and Donald Trump's latest favorite, TikTok. You know, COVID-19 introduced all of us to to Zoom. You know, I don't think anyone here would not know what is Zoom today. To, to, To WebEx, to Microsoft Teams, so that we can now conduct business, we can have cell and prayer meetings, we can attend webinars, we can attend virtual AGMs, all from the comfort of our homes, and often with participants from all over the world. You see, all these logos, they have become so familiar to us. And it is really not very difficult to to guess where the proliferation of technology is going to lead us towards. It might also interest you, uh, especially for those who are bankers in our midst. In this group of global giants, four of them are already valued at well over one trillion US dollars each. You go and work out the zeros. One trillion US dollars each. Apple has crossed two trillion US dollars in market value over the past few weeks. Theirs is really the global market. See, what, what I'm trying to say is this. That the essential infrastructure and platforms for a one world system of government, of commerce, of trade, of communications is already available in some form, even right now, you know, and with time, they will be further refined and enhanced. But having said all this, uh, we must always bear in mind that all these, all these companies, they are all man-made. Uh, even to some extent, the mammon-inspired, mammon-motivated structures. So when Christ comes back in his second coming, He may choose to assimilate some of them. While you may still have your your Apple iPhones, you may still have your Windows OS, or he may choose to totally dismantle all these structures and start all over again on a clean slate with an entirely new system for his global kingdom. But the trend is certainly there. You know, the millennial kingdom will also be a period of uh, unprecedented peace and prosperity in the world. This is the Isaiah Wall, located in New York, directly opposite the United Nations uh, headquarters. The text on the wall is from Isaiah chapter 2, verse 4, which uh, Pastor Ma read earlier. And you may have noticed, if you check in Micah chapter 4, verse 3, it's practically the same, the same word for word for that verse. Eh? Who is the original? Who is the copy? Uh, we, we may never know or whether both of them took, uh, took, took, took this uh, passage from, from a third source. 
But that's, that's not critical. What we do know is that the, the mess, this message about the kingdom is important enough for the Holy Spirit to direct both prophets to include into their writings. You see, God has spoken twice on the same thing. So we must listen up. See, verse 3 describes Christ as the, as the righteous judge in the kingdom and says that he shall judge between many peoples and shall decide disputes for strong nations far away. Today, the United Nations tries to undertake this role, but often with very limited success. In the millennium, the verdicts and the judgments of King Jesus will be final and binding throughout the world. You know, in Chinese we say, "Hai si Yesu so le suan. You know, because his, his judgments are without bias, you know, without, without any political agendas. So even the most sensitive multilateral disputes uh, can be resolved. You know, long-standing disputes that have been going on for years, like those in, in the South China Sea, Diao uh, Yutao, the trade wars between the US and China, the trade war between the US and everybody else, you know. So all these will be amicably resolved. See, here we are actually seeing a contrast that Micah was trying to, to draw out between Christ as the righteous judge in the millennium, uh, promising justice, righteousness, and the judges in Micah's generation bent on exploiting the people. Micah told the people, when Christ, the righteous judge, is ruling, he will put an end to all these injustices. Verse 3 ends by saying that nations will no longer will no longer train or learn war anymore. I see some young men here, you know, young men no, no more Pulau Tekong, no more BMT, no more NS. You know, since there's no war, there's no need for training. And since there's no war, there's also no need for war machineries. So, so the guns, the swords will be converted into plowshares and pruning hooks like this. You know, economic tools that now promote work and business. You know, all the aspirations of these sculptures, all the aspirations behind all these ideas. And these, these sculptures are standing right outside the United Nations uh, headquarters, by the way. You know, all this, all these aspirations will be realized. John Lennon has a song, whether you can see his picture, yes, that's right. You know, imagine, you know, those of you in my age group, uh, you, you know this song. This song must take on a new meaning, and the lyrics must be radically changed, because peace is no longer an imagination. Peace is no longer a dream when Jesus Christ is ruling in the millennium. Jerusalem, the city of peace. That's what Jerusalem means, by the way. The city of peace will finally live up to its name when Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, rules there. Can you imagine? You know, imagine the, the social and economic impact that such a massive reduction in military expenditure, in military budgets, the impact that you will have on the world economy. Verse 4 says this, they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree. You know, sitting under the vine, the fig tree, are Jewish symbols of, of economic security, fruitfulness, plenty. Yeah? In Singapore and Malaysia, we say you sit under the, the durian tree, maybe. Yeah? Uh, peace and prosperity in the land have now translated into economic well-being for the individual as well. You see, wealth will be equitably distributed. There will be no poor people. There will be no homeless people. You know, our brother Abraham Yo, he's in my cell group, by the way. Abraham Yo's homeless hearts. The NGO may have to shut his door because there's nothing to do. You know? Verse 4 also says that no one shall make them afraid. You know, literally, there'll be nothing to fear. You, you put yourself in, in the shoes of the poor in Micah's time. You know, living in fear each day, wondering when the next rich landlord or the next wicked official will come and kick down your door in the middle of the night and take away whatever little you have been left with. But Micah says, no one 
will make them afraid in the millennium. Can you imagine? No more fear. In the millennium, there'll be no crime, no more ISIS, no terrorism, no drug syndicates, no human trafficking, no prostitution, no murder. The list goes on. You know, this, this earthly utopia, so long sought after by mankind, written in books of all languages all across the world, will finally be realized in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And God's people will walk in the name of of the Lord forever and ever. Amen? Yeah. You say, you know, all good and fine, all very exciting. Huh? But what does this kingdom have to do with me today? Uh, what's the deal? Let me put it this way. Yeah. If I know that there is a God who gave his only son to die for my sin, who will one day restore this broken world, and bring about a future world as glorious as what we have seen, and then prepare a place for me to be there, how would I respond? How would I respond to a God who does all this for me? Psalms 116 verse 12 says this, What shall I return to the Lord for all His goodness to me? You see, brothers and sisters, this is how much you mean to God, that He will do all these for you. And by following Him, you can look forward to a life that we just described for all of eternity and beginning even right now. You mean everything to God. The question is, does He also mean everything to you? Does He? Is He everything to you? Secondly, I think that a clearer understanding of where things are headed in the future will actually help us to refocus uh, the way we live our life today. You see, when you know what the future holds, it can really help you to clarify how you should live your life today. And so in, in response, in a sense, to the question in Psalm 116, and we will never be able to fully return all of God's goodness. But perhaps one way to return some of God's goodness is to share them with those who are in need. You know, especially those that Micah had been talking about. You know, the poor, the powerless, the outcasts, those on the fringes of life. See, I'm not just talking about money. You know, if we know what God is going to accomplish in the future, could we not, not be His uh, His loudest mouthpiece or the hands and legs where help is needed the most and then point the way to the restoration, the ultimate restoration that is in Jesus Christ. So that the millennium kingdom, which is already a reality for us, can become a reality for them as well. So after describing the millennial kingdom, Micah now continues in, in the rest of chapter 4 to remind the Jews that God's judgment and discipline always had a purpose to it. He says in verse 6, in that day, and this refers back actually to verse 1, in the last days, in that day, and he says this, in that day, declares the Lord, I will assemble the lame and gather the outcasts, even those that I've afflicted. See, as Micah was addressing his, uh, was delivering his message and addressing the people, Assyria, Assyria was about to pounce on Israel in the north and then totally destroy it. Jerusalem will be reduced to a heap in the not-so-distant future. And Micah has seen, seen all this, you know. And he know that life was going to get really, really tough for the Jews. They will be disciplined because of their sin and their rebellion. And as verse 6 tells us, to become the lame, to become the outcast to become the afflicted one. But Micah assured them that God will not abandon them. Uh, he, he will discipline them, uh, but will eventually redeem and gather them to himself. And so Micah continues in verses 7 and 8, and he offers them hope that in the last days, in the last days after gathering his people, God will make them into a strong nation and restore them to their former dominion. 
Now, this promise of restoration for Judah will be fulfilled in the millennial kingdom. When Christ, now remember he's from the tribe of Judah, when Christ will in that day rule the world as king and Jerusalem will become the capital of the world. But before they could even, even look so far to the millennium, Michael warned the Jews in verses 9 and 10, your problems are not over yet. Uh, there is a judgment coming, this time from the Babylonians. You know, especially uh, verse 10. See verse 10. Rise and labor to give birth. Daughter of Zion, like a woman in childbirth, uh, for now you will go out of the city, dwell in the field, go to Babylon. You, you may not appreciate the, the poetic uh, style of Micah, but don't miss the accuracy of Micah's prophecy here. You see, in Micah's generation, Babylon posed very little threat to Judah. It was the Assyrians that they should be worrying about, not the Babylonians. So it is not surprising that when Micah gave, gave his warnings about Babylon, uh, they were completely ignored. 100 years later, the Babylonians defeated the Assyrians, and they ruled the world, and they invaded Judah, and they destroyed Jerusalem, and they sent the Jews into exile, exactly like what Micah predicted would happen. But writing to his own generation while predicting this, uh, this devastation by the Babylonians, Micah continued to give the people hope. Yes, the Babylonians will come. Yes, you will go into exile. But in verse 10, he says this, there, a meaning in Babylon, there you shall be rescued. There the Lord will redeem you from the hand of your enemies. And God did just that. Seventy years of exile in a foreign land. After the 70 years, a small band of Jewish remnants, no more than 50,000 of them, uh, they made their way slowly back to Judah. You can read this account in Ezra, the book of Ezra, chapter 2. They began to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. They resume some of the temple worship and they were generally restored to their land. But Judah never quite became the, the great nation that she once was. You know, the temple, the temple was a poor shadow of the Solomon temple in the past. Um, and the land is devastated by war, devastated by, by neglect, so it was, it was a pitiful sight. So by now, I think the Jews must really feel, it must have seemed to them that God had finally, he had really, really abandoned them. But brothers and sisters, God was not done with them. For out of this motley crew of dejected, discouraged, but faithful ones, who returned to Judah, God preserved this line of faithful remnants. 500 years later, they return, after they returned from exile, the saviour of the world was born. To this very remnants, they came back to the land. And then, and then to set in motion an ultimate restoration for the world. All from this line of faithful remnants who went back. You see, God never forgets His people. God never forgets His promises. God never forgets, full stop. This is our God. This is the God that we have. You know, in a few days, we will know whether it is uh, President Trump again or President Biden. And this next US uh, president already has his work cut out for him to get COVID-19 finally under control, I hope and then to unite a nation that is so torn apart by race, by politics, by income inequality. You know, this divisiveness is uh, not, not unique to the US. You just look across the causeway and you see the political jostling that has been going on for, for so long. I have friends who are polit politicians there. Wow, it is very, very tough. See, our world is so divided. With, with individuals, with nations, you know, all, all vying 
for prominence, for advantage, and often putting the self-interest above uh, truth and simple decency. See, brothers and sisters, this is not the kind of world that I want to live in, if I, can, if I have a choice. Huh? But there is hope. Chapter 4, verses 11 to 13 shows us exactly where this divided world is headed and literally ushers us into the last days of the last days as the millennium unfolds. You know, the three verses here describe the scene of a final battle uh, with hostile enemy nations gathering up and lining up against uh, the armies of God uh, without going into too much details because uh, this is really another huge topic in, in, uh, in the end times. Uh, the Bible describes this as the battle at uh, Armageddon. And Christ, at his second coming, will assume the role of uh, commander-in-chief and will lead the people of God to victory against the enemy nations. And having won the, war and won the battle, he will gather enemy nations like sheaves of grain, as verse 12 and 13 tells us, threshing and pulverizing them before ushering in his millennial kingdom and then bringing about the utopian conditions that we saw earlier. In closing, I, I just want to leave us with some final thoughts that we can take away from Micah chapter 4. Firstly, I think it is important that we remind ourselves that God's revelation of end-time prophecies is not meant to tickle our curiosity about the future, but to bring about transformation of our lives in the present. You know, it can be very tempting uh, when we hear things like that uh, to gravitate towards uh, the sensational, uh, to gravitate towards the debates, uh, who is right and who is wrong. No? And then we miss the big picture and we miss the intended lesson. Head knowledge can only do so much. But if we assimilate and apply what the Word of God is actually teaching us, true transformation can really begin to take place. Secondly, let's remember that God's discipline uh, is meant for our refinement and our restoration, not our destruction. You know, as His children, God will discipline us and He will do it for our own good. We saw throughout uh, chapter 4 that even as God brings about discipline, He also offers hope. He also offers comfort at the same time. So when we step out of line, God will discipline us uh, because sin will have to be dealt with. But he will never abandon his children. See, when gangrene attacks the body, the affected part must be cut away to save the body. It will be painful, but it is the right thing to do. So, brothers and sisters, may we not lose our sensitivity to sin, and may we not live in denial of our sins, like, like the people in Micah's generation were doing. So that as we heed God's discipline, He will forgive, He will refine, and He will restore us. And lastly, knowing that God will bring about an ultimate restoration of the world through the millennial kingdom, it gives us hope. You see, hope is such a powerful force. Without hope, the brokenness that we see around us can sometimes really drive us crazy. And, and drive us to, to despair. So it is, it is comforting to know that there is an end to the madness. That life is not arbitrary. It is not karma. It is not bad luck. That injustice and brokenness are not what God intended in the very first place. So if you happen to be a victim of injustice today, you know, take heart. God, God knows and He promises you ultimate justice in the kingdom. If you are helping others to overcome injustice, now you are in the process of helping other over, others overcome that, but you find the process so difficult and so discouraging at times, I, I encourage you this morning, look to God's promises in the kingdom and may the reality of the millennial kingdom give us hope to press on when things uh, become too much to bear. See, I've requested the music team to, to lead us in this closing song by, by Scott Wesley Brown, this little child. Uh, to be honest, I was uh, very tempted to want to sing it myself. 
You know, I've actually sung this song many times in different places. The title is a little bit uh, Christmassy, This Little Child. So we often do it at Christmas. But actually, it is a, a, an evergreen, prophetic song. A song that, that, you know, that tells us about Christ's return as king and rule. It was written almost 40 years ago by Scott Wesley Brown. But the conditions in the world that he described are still very much the same today. If anything, it has gotten worse. So I trust that the words of the song will, will minister to you and will encourage you. God bless you. Shall we rise as we respond with this song?
said we'll return to judge this world the living and the dead oh can't you see the long ago so very far away that jesus christ our only hope is born by king that day. Would you remain standing and uh, let's join me in a word of prayer. Father, when we look at the world today, we sometimes wonder how long, Lord, how long before you come back. Lord Jesus, we yearn for your return to put an end Lord, to all this madness and all the brokenness that we see around us. And Father, we cry with the prophet Micah that we may see justice, Lord. Even if it has to come from us, Lord, we ask for your grace that we may see justice in the world. And for us, your children, to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with you. We ask this in Jesus' name and for his glory. Let's receive the Lord's uh, benediction. And now, may God our Father, the source of all goodness, be your guide this week. And by His Spirit, may you be emboldened to do good to others. May the light of Christ, our King, overshadow the evil in this world as we seek His heart daily. May His kingdom come. May His will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Please be seated as we, take a, as we see the announcements on video. Thank you. The service is over. Those of you who need prayer may come forward. <laughs>